Hello, Ty Salva. How are you? I am doing well. How are you today? I'm doing well, doing well. I want to thank you, of course, for joining me in uh, the in our classroom conversation for Teach Your Own Kid. Uh, it is always a pleasure speaking with you. It's always a pleasure um, t communicating with you. It, it, it works for me. <laughs> How's it going? Um, it is going well. We are, you know, ramping up into the, the summer and deciding on what to do with um, kids with this time and looking forward to and planning for the upcoming school year, which is right around the corner. It is. It's right. And didn't we just officially have like the first day of summer? Like, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and already making plans uh, for the fall. And I'm telling you, I was having a conversation earlier with a dean of, uh, she's a dean of a school and we were talking about, hey, making preparations post-pandemic or still mid-pandemic, yeah. right? Uh, so still making those plans and what schools are doing uh, for the fall. Uh, so I, that's important that we begin to make those, those decisions. And even with you as a homeschool mom who is making those decisions about uh, what needs to happen, right? Right after this summer, which is gonna be gone in the blink of an eye. So I definitely want to give our, um, our audience, give our viewers a little bit of background. I know that you and I, we met uh, some years ago and it was through, uh, I saw you on, I, I want to say that it was definitely on a news station yes. and you were talking about homeschooling and we were still pretty new uh, establishing our school and we had established our school as a homeschool for parents who wanted to but couldn't, right? That was our tagline. We, we established it for parents who wanted to homeschool. They wanted all of the, the, the good stuff that goes along with homeschooling, but couldn't mm -hmm. for a reason, got to work, don't feel adequate, those kinds of things. So that is the conversation that we are having today of homeschooling for parents who want it to be done, but definitely uh, what for whatever reason cannot get it done and I think we're going to come back we're going to circle around because we're having this series of conversations we're going to circle back around and give our audience a little bit more of an in-depth view on your take and your experience with homeschooling which is uh, which is a phenomenal story uh, that I think that everybody needs to hear uh, your background so today we're talking about uh, homeschooling other people's kids right? Yes. Those things that need to be taken into perspective, taken into consideration when we are thinking about homeschooling someone else's kids. So let's start from the beginning. Why? Let's start with the why. Why would anyone be in a position where they are homeschooling someone else's kids? So there are people who end up doing it for multiple different reasons, and I'll share maybe the top three, right? So for some people, when they make the decision to homeschool somebody else's children, it's because they have given up a job to homeschool their child. And so since they are home and doing theirs, they say, well, I can homeschool somebody else's child too and charge a little something, and then it'll actually provide some income for homeschooling my child. and my child now has somebody else that we are homeschooling with at the same time. So sometimes it is the, it's the person who's actually doing the teaching that says, hey, you know what, to make this work financially, I need to take in somebody else's child to do this. Sometimes you end up with somebody saying, hey, Ari, I know that you're homeschooling Susan's children. Can you homeschool mine too? Yeah. Right. So sometimes you're asked and, and based on the reason, whether you know it's a child who is falling through the cracks at school or who is excelling and bored out of their mind. Um, and you say, okay, well, let me like, oh, well, yes, I really want to help this family out. Um, and there are other times where I do think that people end up Taking, taking advantage of feels a little bit harsh, but again, when you have that friend that you know is home, that it's easy to end up, well, when, you know, I can't go pick them up, so can you do that? And then it kind of just turns into, um, like, you homeschooling somebody else's children. 
Um, and this really came up for me as I had a great conversation with a woman about a week ago who said, hey, like, what does it look like legally? Can I do this? And I reached out to her and, and found out her situation. And it was that of people knew she was homeschooling her grandson and said, hey, can you homeschool mine too? And what the three things I told her to take into consideration with all of this would be one, are you on the same page with discipline, with expectations, with what happens when a child shows up one day and decides they don't want to do the work, right? Because as a, as a parent, and, and I know from your, from your uh, first book, you know, you would, you would tell parents not to do this, but as a parent, you send your child to school with the expectation that the teacher's doing all the work, mm -hmm. right? A lot of parents don't assume any of that work. And so they do the same thing with somebody who's homeschooling their child, right? I am wow. paying you to do this job, so you need to educate my child. Yeah, yeah. And again, yeah. it doesn't all happen in this out, the few hours that we are together. Yes. So that was, that was a huge one, um, especially when you think about disciplining and um, how another child's behavior is going to impact your child's behavior, right? So when this other child comes in and can have their snack whenever they want to, or doesn't have to do this when you ask them to the first time, then your child is like, well. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I see how we play this game. You could all have as much authority as I thought you had, mom. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's a huge piece. And then, you know, the things that you do with your own child where you might, you know, be a little bit sterner with them and say, hey, I need you to do this now. Do you feel comfortable doing that with this other child? Yes. And you go tell their parents, they, you were mean to them, and then you have that to deal with. And then you have that. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. You have no control over what they do when they're not with you. So you can say, we are learning fractions. I need you to go home and practice fractions. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, then what? Yeah. Come with, to you the next day unprepared, and then it can end up making your child fall behind because they're not ready. Because now you have to spend that time going over what we went over yesterday because there was no reinforcement. Yes, yes. You have truly, so you have truly become a school. Yes. Whether it's one student or a thousand students. Absolutely. It's your job to educate this young person, this child. Exactly. Right. So. Oh. Now, what happens when you get sick? Wow. Oh. Well, <laughs> no, we didn't think about that. <laughs> exactly. Or in this case, so the woman, remember I said she was a grandmother. Yeah. What happens if that child gets sick and their parents send them to you anyway, which could in turn make you sick? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So especially while we're in the midst of this pandemic, that's not something that you can take lightly. Mm -hmm. right? um, then the third thing that you need to certainly take into consideration if you, if you have those two first things figured out and you're like, yes, this child is, you know, not a behavior problem. They are, you know, on it. I know that we have that. That's it. And the mom, you know, say has a flexible schedule. So if I'm sick or if the child is sick, we have a plan B. So then the next thing I would advise you to do is to look at the level of the child that you would be teaching to make okay. sure that it's comparable to where your child is, right? Yes. That falls within that range so mm -hmm. that you aren't preparing lessons for a high school when you don't have high schoolers yet, or that now you have to teach pottying to a, a younger child when you're past that stage, right? And so, and so that is, and, and that's something that I had not even thought of as an educator and someone who understands uh, although I have not been in, as immersed in the homeschool environment as you have through your organization, NOLA Homeschoolers, which is uh, something that I definitely want our audience to know about as well. But the what I had not thought about is how important it is to make sure that the the if you're going to homeschool someone else's kid, that you, they need to be in sync 
with what is already going on in, in your home. Yes. As you're going to bring more stress on yourself if you are working below level and your child is here or if your child is here and then now you've got to make this huge jump, right? So there yes. needs to be a safe range of, okay, you know what? I can do this because my child is in or around, uh, at or around that same level. So, so why, can, can we back up just a little bit and talk, up, talk about why some parents would want to homeschool knowing that they are not in a position to do so? What are some reasons that parents will either pull their kids from schools or uh, in your experience, what are some reasons that parents say, I, I would rather send my kid to my neighbor to be homeschooled because that that's essentially what we're doing i would rather send my kid to a neighbor to be schooled at home than to send him to send her to the school in our neighborhood or, or where my other kids are so what are some reasons that you're hearing in your experience so one of those reasons would certainly be kids either slipping through the cracks or they are bored out of their mind right oh, so you one of both extremes, right, where a child is in the third grade but already working on sixth grade material. Um, some schools are not quick to um, advance a child in grade because of other factors. And so, so then your, your child isn't learning or your child comes home and says, well, mom, since I knew the material already, the teacher just asked me to go help somebody else you know, with theirs. And so then you're like, well, but you're not learning. You, yeah. You're teaching and I appreciate that. And that's wonderful. <laughs> right. But you're not learning in class, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, some teachers are creative like that. Some teachers will let the child go to the library and do independent sort of study to keep them occupied for that time. But there are some teachers who end up not right and so then they will have strict rules for the sake of having rules like even if you finish the work you can't read a book in my class or you can't and so now this child is acting out because they have no other options so that and is there, so fun and there and that i want to stick to that point for just a sec just a second there are so many kids that are sent to the office on a daily basis their homes are being called on a daily basis and oftentimes, it's not because that kid is a behavior issue in and of itself. It, many times, it is because that behavior is caused by boredom. Yes. That behavior is caused because there are arbitrary rules that don't make any sense. And I would prefer to be outside of the classroom, even if it means in the principal's office, mm -hmm. because at least there's a little bit of excitement in my day. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so the, so those are the, so that is a sect. That's a section of kids whose parents will say, you know what? I can't leave my job every day to come get him. Mm -hmm. I can't stop what I'm doing every, you know, at twice a week to say, okay, I'll come and pick him up or I'll put him on the phone. Let me have a conversation with him. I would rather send him next door, bring him, bring him across the water to my, my, my friend who mm -hmm is already homeschooling her kid right there's that and then you said there's another reason so there so, are yes kind or exactly so then we also have health issues right mm. so whether that's your child's physical health the number of parents who said that my child has this condition they've missed too many days of school to pass they want to hold them back it's not that they don't know the material, but they just missed too many days. So how do I hold my child back who knows the material, who's ready to move on, but just who has missed too many days of school, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. the um, physical health of the child, but then there's the emotional and mental health of the child. If a child is being bullied or if a child um, has anxiety, test anxiety, right? Yeah. And I've I've you know, worked with parents who, in second grade, the, the poor little girl was throwing up every morning, 
Wow. morning before she went to school because she had anxiety about being in school. And so when they would come home at the end of the day, like they couldn't do anything. They couldn't stop the grocery oh. store. They couldn't stop to get gas. They couldn't make any stops because she would have a full blown meltdown. Wow. And so th their life was so restricted that like they would have to plan activities on the weekends to do these little errands that they could easily have done um, during the week. But yeah. Once they picked her up, they had to get her straight home. Um, and so that's that's a challenging life to- My goodness. <laughs> that is, yeah, to say the least, that is challenging. Wow. And, yes. so, and I've run into, I've, I've, I've come across families, we've worked with families that have similar situations. So even the health issue, mental health, as well as physical health, I, I had a similar student who um, would call, as soon as she got to school, she was sick. Every single day, as soon as she got to school, okay, send her to the office because she needs to call home, she needs to go. And literally she would get physically ill. Yes. Physically ill because of the anxiety that was caused by the school environment. Mm -hmm. And also even this year we had a, um, a student who because of a health issue, had to miss a lot of days in a traditional school. And I'm, there, there's nothing wrong with having rules. There's nothing wrong right. with being uh, an attendance policy. But mom said, I need to move her because she's getting so discouraged. She's getting so discouraged that she's already dealing with this illness that causes mm -hmm. in her body to the point that I have to, I have to dress her sometimes. So there are many, many times that she cannot make it to school. So not only are they not working with us to make sure she gets the work so that maybe at eight o'clock at night when she's feeling okay, she can get up and do the work. We're not getting that kind of cooperation, but we're also, when she gets back to school, she's so far behind. Mm -hmm. They've continued to move, of course, and she's so far behind that she's getting discouraged. So those are the prime candidates for, for homeschooling, even if it means I can't do it myself, but I have someone who can. So when, when parents are looking for, uh, when parents are looking for those kinds of options, an opportunity to pull their kids from uh, a detrimental environment and place them in a uh, a, a more productive, a more positive environment. What kinds of things should parents look for? Uh, I know we spoke a little bit about what we should look for on the educator side, but what should parents look for when it comes to finding someone to take care of your kids uh, academically during the day? So I think that parents need to take a couple of things into consideration. So one, the homeschooling itself, the educating of your child at home, um, definitely before high school can take as little as three hours a day, right? So you may not need someone to educate your child. You may be able to actually educate your child and you need somebody to, to help with supplemental things. Yeah. So that's only one thing I would, I would, you know, tell parents to consider that, you know, if you work a regular nine to five and you say, okay, well, I am going to get up an hour early and do one hour before I leave to go to work. And then we'll do two hours when we come home from school when it, we've been doing homework anyway. Now, yeah. that, now that part is done. So then you can find a partner, a friend, a neighbor that you can say, hey, you know what, like my child is, they're done with their academics. So I need somebody else to engage and do activities and maybe go on field trips and visits to the library. Um, that could even be doing like a nanny share, yeah. right? Where you think creatively about how this can happen and what this looks like. You, you know, get a nanny who speaks a foreign language and then they're, they're being immersed in another language all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you do this with a few friends, with kids who are of the same age, that is a great way to end up um, still allowing them to interact with their friends, but spend their days doing things that they actually love and enjoy, um, mm -hmm. that the work is getting done outside of that, right? Yeah. So yeah. that would be one. If you have found a... Um, I like to tell people that if you just need 
your child physically out of the building, out of a school building. Any of the virtual online programs like K-12 or maybe Connections Academy, um, if you do a search for virtual online public schools, you will find them. And those yeah. are options because they say, hey, I will you're a part of the public school. So they send you all of your curriculum. They, I mean, you have access to online teachers. Um, so if that was not your issue, that's a viable option for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. However, if you are more particular in the needs that you have for your child, if you say, well, I know that maybe they aren't on grade level, and so we need somebody who's going to help them get to grade level, or mm -hmm. they are working ahead, and so we need that, or we're really interested in the um, Charlotte Mason approach of education, so we want to follow that, then you would end up finding somebody in any one of those specialties. But then again, you also need to look at those other things, like how do you handle food? How do you handle um, behavior or discipline issues? What's your policy on television? How much are you going outside to find somebody that you feel like you are completely in sync with to create this partnership? Yeah, and that's truly what it is. It's a partnership. So I hear you saying things like nanny share or uh, connecting with others that have the kinds of resources that you need. And part of that also is making sure that you make yourself available in whatever way. If you have resources to swap, because I know obviously the average parent uh, does not have the kind of disposable income to just say, okay, I'm going to pay whatever it costs. The average, mm -hmm. there are some of us who are doing very well and we, and price is not an uh, option, cost is yes. not a, uh, or an issue. But uh, for the average parent, it's gonna be important to make sure that you're also making whatever resources available to strengthen that partnership and that way everybody in the partnership can win. So with that in mind, how do we begin, whether on the educator side, and you may have to answer these two separately, but on the educator side, how do I decide what I am willing to be paid, what I am willing and paid, whether it is trading, whether it is trading services or actual monetary payments, how do I decide that? And then on the flip side of that, as a parent, how do I decide what this is worth to me? So, and that is, that is definitely like the, you know, question of the day, right? Yeah. As, if you were sending your child to a private school, there is a tuition involved, right, yeah. for the work that they are doing. And you certainly need to make sure that you're not undermining the work that whoever is educating your child is doing. Now, I think that there are some different things to consider if you are the one doing the educating and if they are really doing like the supplemental things, okay. right? So they're taking, like the kids are going to be at the zoo today and at the museum tomorrow and the heavy work of education is there. So then you're kind of paying for a babysitter, right? So then yeah. you can end up looking at, at rates like that because that's what you're actually paying for. There are certainly ways that if you were looking at an individual who is homeschooling your child where, as you said, you can leverage resources and you can say, you know what, um, we can, you know, my teenager can come, you know, one day a week and cut your grass for you, right? I can, or I know somebody who cleans houses and we can make barters and trades. So once a week they can come and clean your house. So any other services that you would have paid for, or yeah. you had to do yourself that now are getting done for you, you can take those into consideration and say, hey, you know what? Like I can do this for $100 a week plus, you know, not having to worry about taking care of my grass and, right. you know, getting my house cleaned once a month, yeah. right? So yeah. there, there are certainly things that you can do in that vein. Um, I would certainly, and some of this, is also dependent upon the area that you live in, I would certainly look at the cost of childcare, the cost of private schools, and look at some sort of average in between that to say, hey, if they were in a private school, it would be $4,000 a year that I would be paying. Yeah. My 
isn't a private school because I can't afford to pay four thousand dollars. Got and it. The loan that I could get to send my child to a school, right? Those education loans. I'm, I don't think they can be applied to homeschoolers. Yeah. So, so you can't. You don't have that excess either. So that's things that you have right. to take into consideration, right? Um, I mean the. Certainly the hardest part when you're looking at this is that you may have somebody who says, okay, well, I'm going to pay you $100 a week for homeschooling my child. And then, you know, you go out and you buy curriculum, you buy materials, you do all this stuff, you get prepared. And then a month later, they're like, okay, it's not working for us. And then they stop. Well, then you're still out of all of the money that you spent on material. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So something else to take into consideration with, okay, so here's your supply list. <laughs> you need to come with these things. Absolutely. So that if don't work out, you know, I'm not in the hole at least for, for, for this. Yeah. So what I hear you saying, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I hear you saying is, although this is maybe not a traditional, in a tradi traditional sense, a business, it still needs to be run like a business. Absolutely. Whether, uh, discipline or um, structure or uh, all of those things, finances, supplies, resources, all of leveraging resources, relate, all of this needs to be run like a business. And I would go so far as to say, maybe in writing, some sort of agreement in writing, because there is something to be said uh, when, you know, when whatever happens, you know, I decide, oh, it's not working for me or the school that I want, I was, you know, I wanted my child in this particular school, but the reason I decided to homeschool is because they didn't get in, but now they're in and, you know, but now you've spend all of this energy, all of this time, all of this money on resources to help my child. And now I have made a different decision. But if we have it in writing, a simple agreement, then we know what the expectation is if something like this were to happen. So I think that that is critical, critical. Uh, as we begin to move into the final part of this part of our conversation, our series that we're having, which I am thoroughly enjoying, Ty, you just, um, Talk a little bit about ages, the ages of the kids. Is there a certain age where this, whether it's you know too young, too old, where this is not the ideal setup? Where, where what is not the ideal setup? Is, Take somebody's is, child or? Yeah, is there an age where you might say, oh, you may want to steer clear of this age range or, or is it pretty much a free for all? If you can handle it, do it. Um, and and even if, and I'll let you answer that part, and then I'll come back with my follow up. Sure. So I would say definitely it's more of that free for all, right? They all right. have people who love teens, who love engaging. I know the conversations I can have with my teenagers, like we could have for hours, yeah. right? We can talk about politics and religion and, um, you know, history and tie it all in together. And there's something that is so electrifying and energizing about that. Um, but with my 17 month old, we're teaching her new words. And so last night, like one of her new words was vibrate, um, because we're watching the letter factory and there's a vibrating V and yeah. it's so cute. And so it's so fun to see her practice her little words and, and sing her little songs. So certainly it's where your heart lies. You know, if the teenage years and the hormones and the emotions and the mood swings are not your thing, don't yeah. take somebody else's teen, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, however, if you can't deal with that kind of tween you know, 10 to 12, like, I don't know. I think I'm cool. I, I, and I think I'm grown, but I'm really not. And Exactly. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yes. So you have to find the sweet spot for you. And if you, so with me, with a larger family, you know, there are some kids that I have that would work better with somebody their age or on their level. And we do need to make sure that we don't get confused just about the age right? Because they could be a year older or younger than your child and working on that same level. So definitely make sure that you're, you're looking at both of those things and not yeah. 
not just the age, because I've had a few people who were disappointed when they were like, oh, I have a 12 year old too. Let's get our, our boys together. They can do math. And I was like, okay, but he's taking algebra one. And they're like, oh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, is your baby ready for algebra one? <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. right. And so, and so, so there's a little disappointment there when yeah. they can't be in the same class together. So um, again, think of, but it, you also need to be, you know, taking into consideration car seats. Do you need a car seat for this child? And remember, like, we're not talking about, like, just like toddlers, yeah. you know, the kids up until, I know some of mine until 10 needed a booster seat because of their height and weight. And <laughs> so, you know, that's another thing to take into consideration too. Do you feel comfortable with this person transporting your child? Because yes. if we're to the museum today, like I'm driving to the museum, but do they text and drive? Do they? Wow. Right? So there's wow. so many other pieces that you just need to make sure you're on the same page with. Um, because maybe you text and drive too, but it's your child, right? Yeah. And so yeah. somebody else texting and driving with your it child. Gets a, it gets a little bit scary when you see somebody. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So take into consideration not just age, but also ability. Yes. Take into consideration the character, the personality, the uh, the 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 practices uh, yes. and the person to which you're entrusting your child and vice versa. Absolutely. Um, so if so, I, th I think this is a really good start to uh, a conversation that I'm sure we're going to continue having for uh, for the benefit of those of us that are on either side, whether we are. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the educators that are helping to homeschool other people's kids or on the side where we are parents who want the homeschool experience, but for whatever reason cannot directly provide that for our kids. So to have this kind of a resource and this kind of discourse in, uh, in that vein, I think is going to be beneficial to those that are, that are watching, those that are listening. So as we wrap up today's conversation, I wanna make sure that everyone knows in the Teach Your Own Kid community that we are speaking today with none other than Ty Salvant of New Orleans, Ty Salvant as she, <laughs> her husband would say Ty Salvant. Yes. But, but <laughs> Ty Salvant of NOLA Homeschoolers, which is an organization that helps to facilitate um, the homeschooling of countless kids here around uh, the New Orleans area and the surrounding areas. Did I get that right, Ty? You got it right. You got awesome, it Awesome. Right. Awesome. So I want to thank you so much, Ty, for spending these couple of minutes with me today. I'm looking yes. for the next conversation, and I believe that it's going to continue to help those families that are watching, those families that are listening. So we want you to click this, like it, share it with those that you think might benefit from it. Uh, because here in uh, the Teach Your Own Kid community, we are doing whatever we can to make this process of educating your child uh, as easy as possible. So thank you again for joining me today, Ty. You're more than welcome. I look forward to our next talk. Yes, ma'am.